Uh, get it set up. Okay, we're streaming on Facebook, Mastermind Live with Neil Schwartz and two special guests today. Very excited to welcome uh, Melinda Elmer from the Melinda Elmer team out of Long Beach, California, working with uh, our company there in the Long Beach Single Hill area, and Robert Kofer representing from Glendora, the Mark and Al team up in the Glendora area. So welcome guys and gals. We're very excited to have you here. Thank you very much for taking the time and spending it with us. Um, <clears throat> a couple things real quick about, uh, that I feel that's interesting about Robert and Melinda is their production right now as of last Monday was about $500 in GCI apart, which has been kind of interesting because Melinda's been ahead of Mark and Al really for the first time since they came with our company in 2000. Uh, she's been ahead most of the year. That switched slightly on Monday, although I have a hunch based on closings this week that, that, that this keeps going back and forth. So this is a lot of fun. But as of Monday, they were $500 apart on a $1.3 million worth of GCI. So Congratulations, you guys. Lots, guys, lots of business, lots of things going on. All right. Melinda, if you would just give us a quick Reader's Digest version. A lot of the agents on here know you and do business with you, and you've been around with us for a long, long time. But, you know, maybe what areas you service, how long in the business, uh, the size of your group, et cetera. Sure. Um, I'm in Long Beach. I've been in real estate for 18 years now and um my team consists of one buyer's agent and uh, i have a director of operations a tc and uh, another admin okay perfect good stuff uh and robert you're uh, the junior member of the team mm -hmm. and so uh, does that mean you're calling Mark and Al seniors by calling me junior, but I won't tell them that you said that. Uh huh. They're probably <laughs> watching somewhere. I'm in big trouble. <laughs> Pro probably you are. But um, yeah, we're out of Glendora. Like you said, we basically service the 210 corridor um, everywhere from Pasadena out to Rancho. We try not to mess with Pasadena because we don't want Meg to get after us too much. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm 31, but I make the joke that I've been in the business for 30 years because obviously I've, I, I, I've been around, uh, my dad who's been doing this for 40, I think it's going on 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our staff is both Mark and Al, and, uh, then there's myself and we have Brianna and Mohit, uh, Mohit just joined the team. So two buyer's agents now. And then I think our setup in the office is similar to Melinda, listing coordinator, somebody who handles um, marketing and just numbers tracking and stuff like that. And that's it. Got it. Great. Excellent. Number of closed transactions year to date uh, is pretty close. I went over that a little bit with you, Melinda. You're running 80. I'm at 80, 80 closed and then um as of this morning 80 and i have nine pending as of today all right so eight so 89 closed and pending yeah yes and you're, you're shooting for 110 115 closed transactions this year right okay and that that uh, excellent and robbie how about you i thought we were at 80 and melinda was at 83 but maybe I reversed the numbers um, and I want to say we're at seven, seven pending as of this morning. Okay, good. All right. So, so you guys are pretty much neck and neck in terms of closings and in business, Melinda's got um, the size of her team and you have the size of yours. I'm interested mainly today to talk about what you guys are doing and have been doing to ramp up to help make the fourth quarter the best quarter 
that you have had. As I was talking with Robert earlier today um, and Melinda a little bit yesterday, the fourth quarter is almost always your best quarters. And you both have had phenomenal first three quarters. So Melinda, tell us a little bit about what you do to, to get your mindset going to help make that happen for yourself. It helps that I have experience that in the past, the fourth quarters have been good for me. I, a lot of it, I think, has to do with the discipline that I have, that every day I expect that I go in and do my job every single day. And that my clients expect that I'm going to sell their houses, whether it's December or whether it's June. And I mean, even years and years ago, there would be many times where I would be the only agent in my office. Now, obviously, that's not the case anymore. But um, before I came to Masters, I would be the only agent in my office prospecting every day. And I think because the other agents weren't working, I was just picking up even more business. And so I love the fourth quarter because there's less people working, but still there's plenty of people that have to sell. So I'm there to help them. Got it. Excellent. Excellent. Robert, how about you guys? <laughs> well, I made the joke with you this morning that a lot of the fourth quarter um, motivation comes from guilt for from taking some time off during, uh, during the summer there when there was nice weather. Um, so we get motivated because we know it's going to gear us up for the beginning of the year. And then, like Melinda said, it's kind of nice to know uh, that nobody else really wants to work. So to pick up your phone and have a pulse, you're doing more business. Robert made a comment this morning that he said a lot of the success from the way he views the fourth quarter comes from most of the agents who don't work and his group does. And I think Melinda, we talked about exactly the same thing. It's not that, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not that you guys and your teams work harder or more hours in the fourth quarter. It's the fact that you are consistent with your effort during the fourth quarter as you are in the first and second quarter and since there's nobody working, it's a great quarter for you. Is that, is that how you feel with it, Melinda? Absolutely. I think there's there's less competition. Um, and I I heard on a panel that I was on last year, and Robert was listening, and the guy, one of the agents said, Oh, well, there's nothing happening in the fourth quarter. So just start planning for next year. I was like, Thank you for saying that. I'm so glad. I hope everyone else heard that and followed that same advice exactly. because, um, because if you are working and you're consistent about everything you're doing, there's so much more opportunity out there for you. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So, so Robert, what do you guys work on in the, in the, that might be different for the, uh, fourth quarter than some of the other agents or what I mean let me rephrase it where's your business come from I mean it out of the sky right you spend tens of thousands of dollars on Zillow and that's where all the, the deals come from right right <laughs> yeah no that's just we just hit, we just pay more and answer the phone no <laughs> it um it's a lot of follow-up Neil I I think I mean I guess that's not a source but I would say that we fourth quarter, people tend to be more readily available to take calls. Um, for the buyer's team, I think they find a lot of people who got beat up and kind of threw in the towel over the last quarters or maybe even two or three quarters. So there's a lot of people who, you know, you call and give them good news. And um, I think we pick up a lot of business from that. So I, I will say, not the Zillow thing, but I, I have noticed that fourth quarter, we do tend to pick up a lot more buyer sides than compared to the other three quarters. And, and that's because the buyers are seeing maybe there's an opportunity in the marketplace and they're looking to take advantage of the fact that maybe they're, they could find a deal today, not a deal, but a, something they could buy where, because there's nobody working 
and then they find that there's no real estate agents working. So, right. so then they find you guys. Is that Melinda? Is that what you you're finding? Do, do you do more buyer deals in the fourth quarter, like uh, Mark and Al? Have you thought about that? Um, I would have to look. Uh, I feel like we have a lot more people who have more urgency in the fourth quarter. So we've had a lot of um, things where people are, I need to close by the end of the year. Um, and we have more cash deals that go through in 12 days, 14 days. So sometimes they weren't even on my radar December 1st, but we got them closing before December 31st um, because there's that urgency. They need, they need write-offs, they need whatever. Um, I usually take my Christmas vacation the first week of December because I'm slammed usually the week of Christmas. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so you're getting you're getting opportunities now. Do those opportunities come from you calling your past client sphere, um, or you're running into those on open houses or sign calls? What's how does the, how does that business come? Well, 60, to you? Sixty-five percent of my business is past clients and center of influence. Okay. So a lot of it has to do with that, and then surprisingly, a good chunk of it also comes from sign calls. Um, so, so from the listings that you take from the listings that I take. So right. they might see that I sold the house across the street and they want to do the same thing. Right. Good. Signs right. are great advertising. Yeah, signs are great advertising. Good point. Robert, how about you guys? Uh, what's the percentage of your past client and sphere business? 50%, 5 0. Okay. Comes from past client, past client and sphere. And uh, kind of like Melinda too, when I look at it, probably a quarter of the business co comes from up calls. Whether so that's, you know, they send us a, like yeah, or we, you know, they could text our office line after hours of, about a property or whatever it is. And then we follow up uh, either that night or the next morning. So yeah, a good chunk of it comes from there. 15% um, comes from vendors. So that could be title, title reps, loan officers, CPAs, attorneys, um, you name it. So that's, that's a big chunk too. And then 10% is just other activities. Okay, excellent, good stuff. So um, I wanna switch gears. One of the agents asked me yesterday to ask you guys this. Uh, we run into all kinds of, the market's really kind of crazy and, and you could look at it and say, well, geez, they really don't need us, quote unquote, us to get their home sold and get multiple offers. When you have a seller, Melinda, who says something like that to you, how do you react to that? What do you, what's your go-to on, you know, why, why do I need you? I can sell this house, or it seems like the house will sell on its own and I'll get a good price anyway. What, What's a go-to line or scenario for you there? The biggest thing that I go to is my track record as far as um, list original list price to sales price ratio. Okay. Typically speaking, even if you compare the average agent in my area, they're selling for 101% of list price, which normally would sound amazing but we're selling for 108%. Wow. So that's one thing. And then the other side of that as well is because our team does all the pre-sale inspections prior to the uh, home going on the market. So we have, we've found anything that a buyer might come back and renegotiate for. We have almost zero renegotiation in our escrows as we move along. Uh, because we've already figured all that stuff out beforehand and the buyer accepts the property as is. It makes my, my life much easier. And then um, it also makes the sellers much happier because nobody's coming back and asking for five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 in repair credits after the fact. And then we have an almost zero fallout on our properties as well. So, so those Melinda are huge. Yeah, absolutely. Melinda, walk me through the script because, you know, you're asking a seller to do something that in most markets isn't normal 
to pay in advance for a um, home inspection and, um, and, and have that report. So walk me through real quick, if you can, a little bit of a, a script scenario on that. So Neil, do you know what one of the most frustrating things for sellers are in this market? No, tell me. So you get four, five, six, ten 10 offers on your property. You pick the highest one and you accept that price. Now you think you're going to get that price, right? Right. And yet a buyer then now has all the control. So now they come in and do a bunch of inspections and tear your house apart and find every single possible thing they could find that's wrong with your house. Then they come back and ask you for five, seven or $10,000 in repairs, how does that make you feel? Uh, frustrated, annoyed, unhappy. Absolutely. <laughs> so what would happen if we could just spend $300 and make all of that go away to make sure that you are not leaving any money on the table? Well, uh, how would you do that? We are gonna do all of our inspections, disclosures and reports prior to you going on the market. That way we know everything there is to know about the home and the buyer doesn't have any power to come back and renegotiate. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, that would be awesome. Right, there you go. Excellent. Here it is, it, it's in the contract. So we just have them check the boxes in the listing contract where it says they're gonna do the inspections and all of that beforehand. That's great. That, that, that part of that came from your frustration. I remember working with you guys on you were, you were spending a ton of time going back and forth on, on repairs and you know, negotiations, et cetera, et cetera. It was just killing your prospecting time. Well, and we had one property that we put into escrow and then we found out the foundation needed to be completely replaced to the tune of $50,000. Right. So obviously that fell out of escrow. We had to find out how much that was going to cost. Then we had to get lower the price by $70,000 and then resell it again. Got it. Got it. So great customer service, great return business. Fantastic. Robert, you do a similar thing with uh, explaining to your clients everything and every step of the way. So what, what, what's interesting, I'd like to say this um, about both of you guys, we have this with a lot of our agents in our company, is that um, from a customer service perspective, you guys do a lot of transactions. We're talking 80 to 100, 120 transactions every year. And we almost get no complaints from business that you do. And yet we get complaints from agents that are doing three, four, five, eight transactions a year. And and that becomes, you know, very frustrating for Cindy. Makes her crazy, right, Cindy? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so Robert, what are you guys doing in your um, customer service that that seems to keep bringing the customers back year in and year out? And we're talking about how many customers in your total database for your team? Uh, plus or minus three thousand. Right, and that was that's from when your dad and your uncle started the, the, in real estate 30 something years ago, right? Correct, yeah, so that's since the late 80s, I believe. So I wanna ask a question of you, we'll continue with the answer and then go to Melinda. What do you think, you know, and you've been at your dad's knee from day one, um, mm -hmm. at least for you, maybe not for him. Um, <laughs> what, um, what do you think was the focus on building the database from that time and starting adding to it, nurturing it, calling it out? What was the thought process there? I mean, why did you start and why, you know, you're at 3000 now, but I mean, that's a labor of love. Well, I think it come from, comes from just, a genuine care for our customers you know it's they're not they're not just a number they're people and um you know a lot of customers become friends after the fact and call them on their birthdays they call me on my birthday sometime to wish me a happy birthday 
Um, so I don't know that there was like a, a plan in the 80s, which was, well, I'm sure there's a plan to give great service, but um, I think it just came from genuinely caring. And it, it's funny because I had a friend the other day who, you know, on my, on my days off, he'll see me at the baseball field or whatever. And I take a call real quick. And um, he's like, well, was, was that a customer? Yeah, it was customer because, you know, they had a plumbing leak at their house. Oh, is it in escrow or did they just buy it? I'm like, oh, they bought it like four years ago. Right. But they call me because they know I have a good list of vendors who will take care of them. So it's more than just what I can do. It's what, you know, the people that I have set up and what, what they can do. And, and a lot of those vendors, by the way, are also customers. So it's all symbiotic. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. So, uh Tell me a little bit, tell our group a little bit about what you guys do to make sure that everything is explained and there's no, oops, uh, we forgot that. Uh, specifically, uh, what you do with uh, the taxes on the, the uh, after the deal closes. Do with taxes after the uh, deal the closes. Property tax re reassessment, I guess they call that. Oh, the supplemental property tax. Supplemental. Oh, su oh, supplemental. I mean, okay, you're referencing something I, I think I talked about last time we were on here, which is wow. just, just one thought I had of many, but nobody talks about supplemental property taxes or tells, tells the, um, you know, the buyer to remember they need to set that aside because sometime between now and whenever the whenever the, whenever the county wants to send them the tax bill they're going to get that and it's going to be a large number not always i suppose if it transacted very recently it won't but in many cases it's going to be a pretty large number um but in referencing that we've created a document which we have the seller sign with the listing agreement i'm going to start getting notifications below that says can you send me the document right they're, they're, uh, they're on their way <laughs> <laughs> but you know we go step by step through the whole listing plan of action what to expect um, one of the things i think we put on there that's important too is you know if you run into an agent or a buyer who comes to you directly you hand them a business card and say that's a great question for robert here's his phone number so we just try to future pace, everything, all the big obstacles, you know, the neighbor is going to tell them that they listed for too low. And it's better to have that conversation now than in three weeks when they're panicking because their neighbor just dropped that valuable information on them. So, so just being so, thoughtful, I think. So go through that future pacing on the, on that price. Cause that, that absolutely is happening all over the place right now. How would you role play that with your uh, client? I think what I typically will say, I usually try to make it kind of lighthearted. I'll just say, you know, Neil, something, this, this natural phenomenon occurs when your house goes on the market, your neighbors start to talk to you more. Have you noticed that? Yeah, yeah, I guess that does happen, uh-huh. Right. And they have a lot of motivation because if your house sells for a really high number, then their house is more valuable, isn't it? Correct. And at the same time, they really care who you sell your house to because they don't want to have a bad neighbor. You've been a great number neighbor for all these years, right? That's true. So the other part of the phenomenon, Neil, is you'll start to get free advice. What, what do you mean? Well, your neighbors are going to, and, and sometimes friends and family too, will start to tell you things like, well, you know, you really could have got 50000 more or $100,000 more. And the thing about it, Neil, is it's worth exactly what you paid for it. Nothing, right? You mean the advice? The advice. Right. So you could see, and then we'll go over, if I really feel like I need to, I can go over the comps again, but. I feel that most of the time at the end of our presentation, we've honed in on the price so well that we don't have to cover it again, but even still that that'll come up, right? Oh, totally. It probably comes up in 98% of the cases where somebody at work or a neighbor is going to say that was too low. And you should ask me about the agent I have. Right. Exactly. And I've even had it before where, 
we list it, you know, we try to list it at the sweet spot, which tends to be the lower, lower end of the market value because it tends to be a range. And we'll get offered and you have to prep them to get offers over that. Because I just had one yesterday going to escrow. The first offer we got was 50000 above asking price. And some sellers, if you don't have the conversation, panic. Oh, we underpriced it. We should have priced it a million, not nine fifty. Because look, the first offer came in at a million. What if we did something wrong. So we have to cover that stuff, I think, in advance so that we don't look like a knucklehead or get caught off guard later. That's great. Good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Good stuff. Okay. Um, so Melinda, uh, tell me, what, um, what do you need to, uh, um, where, well, we talked about where your business came from. So I do want to ask you, uh, one of the questions was earlier before you guys came online, because Mark and Al are two people and Melinda is one people, okay? So I know you guys kibitz about this all the time, but um, uh, you know, is there a difference, or is it you know, Mark and Al just take more time off? I mean, what's the what's the deal here? <laughs> Robert, Robert says he's dragging them along with him. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of truth to his humor. <laughs> no, that's not true. They're great. They're great team members. Absolutely. They just keep Robert out front. He's the, he's the eye candy. Thank you, Neil. I think you are too. <laughs> See, not just another pretty face, Robert. <laughs> Good job. Okay, so is there anything there? Or it's just, are you more efficient, Melinda? What, what do you, is there anything, nothing? You know, I like to think I'm more efficient. I mean, I, I like to tease them all the time that I'm only two agents and they have more. Right. But um, yeah. I can confirm that. She has said that multiple times to me. <laughs> and I'm sure behind I'm sure behind our back numerous other times. And it's true. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. Well, that means I'm more profitable. Is, uh, my goal is always to oots Al along a little bit. We'll little, see a little bit of fire coming out. Um, and it's always fun. You guys have been great competitors and, you know, it, it it proves that you can get along with and do business with. I mean, you're sharing, Melinda, you shared with me that that you had, was it from Robert and Mark and Al, seven referrals or was it seven total this year? I forgot the number. I don't know, but we, we do a lot of referrals. I know we have two listings right now that we're co-listed on. You were on a so. listing appointment before you, together, before yeah. you on this, right. Mm -hmm. And we told them we would send them the contract this afternoon because we had another meeting. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and then we have another one we listed. It's just not on the market yet because we're trying to get tenants out. Um, but yeah, and like he's referred me people and I've referred him people and he's got one in escrow right now that I referred him and um, we do... And it's great. I can say that I'm referring them to the number seven Century 21 team. <laughs> in the I country. knew that was coming up. <laughs> it says that because the, the, the awards or the rankings came out yesterday, I guess it was, or the day before, where Melinda in the nation with Century 21 is number six and Mark and Al's team is exactly the next one, they're number seven in the country as of uh, the first of the month. So congratulations, you guys, that, that's a really big deal. It's a tribute to uh, your hard work and the team's work. So good stuff there. But we like to tease each other, so we have fun. No, it's clear that, that obviously. Okay, so let's open this up a little bit. Questions, questions, we've got about 71 agents on right now. Tell me, ask some questions, please, to Robert or to Melinda or to both. I have a question. Please go, Tim. What is your main source of business? Is it COI? Is it, are you doing expires and for rent by owners, for sale by owners and stuff like that? Or is it primarily COI? Past client center influence. Yeah, hers is 60%. 
uh, of her business. Tim is, is past client center influence. And Robert, your team is 50% right now? Yeah, 5-0, 50%. Yeah. Got it. Got so it. Where, where the other, where's the other 40 and 50% come from? Sign calls and internet, mostly. Like, they saw my listing. I mean, it's it all kind of comes back to sign calls, right? Like, or they found our website or found our reviews online or something like that. Yeah, he or she that lists lasts. It's all about getting the listings because you get the sign calls when you're on websites, you get the internet calls, you get those leads. You, It's just, that's fantastic. Robert, you get business in a similar, but slightly, one area is a little bit slightly different. The difference is the, is our vendors, and like I kind of hit on that. That's probably about fifteen percent, one five percent, and um, that could be anybody, right? It could be contractors or you know construction providers. It could be CPAs. It is CPAs. It is attorneys. Um, you know, divorce, probate, estate attorneys. Um, you know, we we lean on our our title reps, our lenders, uh, everybody for referrals. We send them a lot of referrals. So we usually expect that in return. And Robert, how do you like, do you, do you mail to them like a regular database you would, are you calling them like you would your database? The vendors? Yes. Uh, we're not mailing them. It's just, it's just a matter of checking in like some of the some of the CPAs, if I know somebody plays golf, I'll take them out for a round of golf at the country club and just spend, spend some time with them. Um, the attorneys, it's like, you know, they, they kind of all hang together. So a lot of times you'll get in with one attorney and then, hey, do you know anybody else that uh, needs a good agent who knows ha how to handle a probate? Well, you should talk to so-and-so and then you kind of have your foot in the door and, and expands from there. Cool. Thank you. Good. Good stuff. All right. Other questions for Robert Kofer or uh, Melinda Elmer? Anyone else? Just ask. I do. Go ahead, uh, Veronica. We're all in different marketplaces and some of us are seeing notices of default. Um, are you guys um, tapping into maybe some asset managers? Do you see a shift in your area? Because I'm in the San Luis Obispo and our market here is very strong. And we see very little notices of default, but we do see a lot coming from down L LA County, Orange County. Are you guys doing anything with that at all? Any tips on how to get a REO accounts or that's not in your radar at all? I'm curious to know since you guys are so proactive. So I was in the market in 2007 through 2010 and I did some short sales. I think I did two REO listings. It was not really my bread and butter. Uh, I never really, it was frankly a pain in the rear to deal with because you're constantly, I mean, you become a property manager. You have to constantly go check the properties, make sure that they're secure and turn on all the utilities in your name. And there's a lot of cash going out before any cash comes in on those. And, um, a lot of extra management was required. I just went out and sold houses. And in 2007, I made a jump from like 40 homes sold to like 52. So I didn't really need the REO business and I didn't need to rely on it. So no, I don't That's really do awesome. anything with it. Yeah. You know, what about you, Rob? I don't mess with it at all because okay. I'll mess with it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he probably did a couple hundred REO sales and had different asset managers. And he doesn't look back on those years super fondly, I would say. Um, at that time, it's probably different now because at that time, I think he was flying to uh, different states to go to these conferences. Um, and uh, I think he said, I don't think he would mind me saying this, but you know, he'd go to the conference the first couple of days and hang out. And then he realized one day he sat out in the bar and he made more contacts doing that than in there. And then I think it's kind of the same thing with any vendors is they probably hang together. So if you get in with one, you could spread it, but um, it's definitely not on our radar. 
going awesome. forward and I, I I don't think that it would be. Oh. Great no. feedback, thank you. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, other questions for uh, Melinda and Robert. Just speak up, please. Hey, I have one for Melinda. This is Sally. Go ahead, Sally. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I wanted to find out about all the inspections that she does up front, the physical inspection, the termite, all that. I love that. You know, does she ever get any pushback from the buyers who say, well, I'm going to do my own inspections and does the seller get upset with it or is it just, because I love that idea. I've, I've done it on an auction and it worked really well. So, uh, no, I, I generally don't get a lot of pushback. Most people say they love it and they're going to steal the idea from me. And I wish more people would because it would make all of our lives easier. Um, the Sometimes the buyers say, I, we just say, hey, look, we've given, gotten all the inspection reports and disclosures done beforehand. So your buyer knows what they're buying. Of course, they're able to do any inspections, but we're not going to be giving you guys any credits or repairs. Now, with that being said, if we do an inspection and then after the inspection, the water heater breaks and starts leaking, well, the seller's probably going to have to replace that water heater. Um, or, you know, if something happens after our inspection, there's probably going to have to be something to be addressed. Or if something got missed on the rare occasion, it doesn't happen very often. But if something got missed, uh, I'm just thinking of a termite inspection where the inspector couldn't fit underneath the house. And so when a smaller termite inspector went under the house, they did find some additional stuff and we ended up giving them some credit for uh, new things that were found after the fact. But that's pretty rare when that kind of thing happens. And uh, most people love it and it just makes the transaction smoother and we know what they're gonna come back and have issues with before we even get started in the process. Thank you, thank you for explaining that. And then Robert, you know, I just love that little supp supplemental thing that you're talking about. I'm gonna put that in the chat box. Will you send that to me? <laughs> Yes. Um, oh, I no. could give you some ideas. I could give you some ideas. Oh, okay. <laughs> Question, Melinda, do you, what's your contact number per day? What's, per oh, con 20. 20, that's awesome. And how many hours does that take you? Two to three? It depends. Um, I average 20 days. So like one day, some days I'll do 30 and then some days I'll only get five or 10 in. Um, because I do talk a lot of my past clients. I mean, those of you listen to open mic, sometimes I'll spend 20 minutes talking to the same person during, right. during the open mic. And, but if they're just chit chatting, that's one thing, but generally speaking they're we're talking about ideas of what they can do for future investments or possibilities, or, you know, kind of brainstorming things instead of just, Hey, who do you know that, that wants to move? It's, it's trying to figure out ways to help them and their friends and family move forward in their lives and, and become more wealthy. So it's not just, sure, we'll talk sometimes about how the kids and stuff like that, but that's not usually our conversations. Very cool, thanks. I, I have a question, um, Melinda. When you're doing the, having the seller do the inspection for the termite and the physical inspection, are you, re, uh, and the disclosures, are you releasing that back during like seller counters? When are you releasing, release, um, releasing that information back to the buyer's agent? We put a Dropbox link in our MLS and agent remarks and tell everybody that they need to review it prior to submitting an offer. Awesome. And then are you, and in the seller counter, are you telling them they're purchasing the property as is, no credits, no repairs? Are you including in the counter offer? It says sell, uh, buyer has reviewed all inspections or reports made available uh, to the buyer and uh, approves them and understands the property is being sold as is with no additional repairs, credits, or price reductions. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Good. Excellent. Other questions for Robert and Melinda. Hello, everybody. Hi, Zuli. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good, Neil. Thank you very much. Glad Can you're you, here. Thank you. Can you both uh, share a little bit um, your schedule? I would like to, to know how your daily schedule looks like. You want to go first, Robert? 
<laughs> well, I wake up uh, and then the rest is a blur. <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, I usually, I'm sure you just want to hear about when I get to the office, not when I'm bumping around the house in the dark, but um, usually get to the office about 8.45 or 9 o'clock um, from, that, from that time until, usually I'll go for an hour, I'll make calls, past clients mostly. Um, I'll usually take a 15 minute break or something and just kind of stretch my legs. And although I try to stand as much as I can, um, then I'll do probably about another 45 minutes or so of follow-up calls. Um, that brings me in. I should probably just look at my schedule and tell you, um, that brings me into team meetings. We usually meet with the team and the buyer's agents, um, at least three, three times a week just to go over any problems we're running into, um, you know, things of that nature, any, any scripts or objections that we need to work on and practice with. Um, and then mainly for the rest of the day is going on appointments. If I don't have full, full day of appointments, I'll usually try to make some follow-up calls um, or head out early. And usually when I'm driving home, I'm making calls the whole way. Um, and for, and, and Rob, you take Saturdays off, right? I take Friday and Saturday off because I find that Sunday is kind of a convenient day to meet with people. So this is a perfect information. I just want to add something, Melinda, before you answer. Mm -hmm. Ever since I met Mark and Al, I guess when they came, started coming to work with me in 2000, they, that's one of the big reasons they got together as a team was that one would work a five-day work week and take two days off. And then the other one would work, you know, they would flip this back and forth. So they always were taking two days off. So when Robert came into the company, it was normal for him to have two days off and still do the production. And when, when I mean two days off, it's hard to find them when they're on, but don't try to look for them when they're off. <laughs> so Melinda, sorry, go. Uh, yeah, you know, that's why I asked because I've tried to call him on a Friday or, or a Saturday and I don't get him generally. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but now I'm trained. Now I'm trained. Um, so for, for me, um, my schedule has changed because I have a two-year-old nowadays. And originally I used to get up and go to the gym at 5 a.m. and all that stuff. And now my goal is to get the two-year-old to sleep as late as possible. So um, if I can get him to sleep until six, that's amazing. Um, I do try to get up and do some, some sort of movement in the morning. And that's, but that's a new thing for me again. Um, and I usually am, uh, on the phone sometime between seven and seven 30 with mastermind calls or, or things like that. I meet with my staff at eight and take care of whatever I need to take care of between eight 30 and nine, nine o'clock. Generally speaking, I'm prospecting till 12, um, or doing lead follow-up and then, um, lunch and then afternoons are for appointments. Um, Obviously, I, I will shift things around if I need to. We just had a listing appointment at 1130 right before this. So um, I make it work. But yeah, afternoons are pretty much appointments. I'm currently working from home. I usually love working from the office, but it's just more efficient right now. My goal is to be done with my day by 5, 530. If I'm really busy, it tends to kind of stretch a little bit to 6 o'clock. But after six, I'm done and it's family time. And then we all go to bed at eight o'clock. Um, so you can't get me after eight. I take Sundays off and I also take half day on Fridays and I get a massage in the afternoons and I try not to go on. I only work a half day on Saturday. So kind of a, a half day Friday, a half day Saturday. And I try to take one mini vacation per month. So we take a three day weekend and go camping in our trailer. And we keep joking that we need to go and park our trailers somewhere together and go do something fun. We haven't managed to find a time for that work to work yet. 
or a big enough trailer space. True. They have a giant trailer. My trailer's tiny compared to theirs. <laughs> Good stuff. Really good. All bad. right. Other questions for Melinda and Robert, please. No other questions? All right. Unmute yourselves, please. Unmute yourselves. All right. Let's give them a giant hand. <laughs> Thank you so much. Perfect Thank you. Good luck in the year strong. All the way, all the way. Absolutely. So as you guys know, we will go and ask questions. I know it's one o'clock and I'm not sure if you guys have hard stops. You're welcome to hang and listen in. But uh, I, I do want to... I. While they're on the line, I want to make this comment. Um, they're both very intense and they're both very, very hard workers and their teams are equally as intense and hard workers. However, what I think you noticed is that neither one of them really looks like they're breaking a sweat at a million three closed for the first nine months. And I don't know what the pendings are because Robert keeps giving me another number. <laughs> so we'll see what that is. But, um, but they're going to do a million six to a million eight. And I think the goal is two million. Um, not, I hope they'll get it, but a million six to, to a million eight. And I think you'll see both of them are just wonderful, regular people doing it a job, you know, every day for themselves, their families, and they're an absolute pleasure to work with and to coach. So thank you both very, very much. Thank, thank you. you. All right, you guys. Okay, good stuff. Excellent. All right, what did we learn today? What did we learn today? That it's doable. That it is doable. Absolutely, Zuli. Absolutely. All right, what else? What else, what else, what else? What did we learn today? I think uh, what I really learned from Melinda is um, we heard her talk about doing the inspection prior to putting the house on the market before, but I didn't really apply it. But now today, when I heard her again, it stuck in my head and I know how efficient and how effective it could be if we just uh, follow her advice. It could really save us a lot of time and uh, make us look really good in front of the sellers because we're doing them a favor. I, I completely agree with that. We, we, uh, we've been working on that concept with a number of agents and uh, Melinda and her team have taken it to a, a higher level, and it has just really made their life a lot easier. I know that Cindy um, um, would work with you guys if you're working on the technical issues on how to get that done. Um, but it 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 isn't. It's a pretty easy thing. You just have to practice the script on how you're going to get the seller. You think about it. You got a seller putting three, four, five hundred bucks up in advance to get their home sold. That house is probably going to sell, right, everybody? Yes. Yes. Yeah. You've got a motivated seller, so right. It's a very powerful thing. Uh, that's great, Yvonne. Patty, what you? Learn? I have a question. I guess I should have asked when they were on the line, but when they do the home inspections up front. And say it comes back with, you know, quite a few things. Do you just ask the seller if they want to fix anything? Or like if they're, you know, a certain area in the cement is cracked and they're asking you, should they fix it? How do you know what to recommend for them to do? I can answer that question. Thank um, you. It really depends on what it is. I actually tell them before they get the report, I say, this is not a honey-do list. This is not a checklist for you guys to go through and do all these repairs. This is purely information for us to be able to share with the buyers. Now, if it calls out foundation cracks, 
I'm probably going to get my foundation guy out and give us a bid to know how much and how extensive the damage is because those things will scare buyers. If it's GFCI plugs, nobody cares. They don't need to do it. Um, if it's a water heater strapping, then, you know, they're going to need to do that. So, I mean, we all are experienced enough to know what are things that buyers typically have issues with mm -hmm. and what they don't have issues with. And if it's something that, you know, if it says, hey, there might be structural issues with the house, well, then you're probably going to need to call somebody out to, to come check it out. But now you're in charge. Now you're in control. You have the information that puts the seller in much better position. That's really good. Thank you so much. All right. Good, good question, Patty. Great stuff. All right. Other question. What else did you guys learn? What else did you learn today? And uh, can I say something real quick? Um, I want to thank Robert for sh sharing that supplemental property tax thing. We heard that before, but forgot. Can you just, just briefly go over what you say to the clients? Robert? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, well, first of all, it's important to know what a supplemental property tax is by definition, right? You're, you're supplementing the difference from like let's get my house, for example. I bought it from a woman who purchased it in the 50s. So her tax base is obviously really low and really nice. And it's reassessed at what I purchased it for, which in my case was over a half a million bucks. And you have to know what the tax rate is. So if it's one and a quarter percent, if there's no Mela Ruse on average, or at least in my area, I mean, that's going to be over $5,000 in supplemental, the first year only, right? So that's how I explain it to them is, hey, set aside at least, let's say if it's five, at least $5,000, set it aside. And then when that bill comes, you're, you're not caught off guard. Because that's, a, I mean, that's a big bill, especially because you don't even know when it'll come. And it can come in, I think, up to two or three installments, So good so, information, Robert, absolutely. And you're right, you got to know what it is. And what we, some agents, not, not anybody else on here, but some agents we've had to deal with and other companies have no idea what it is and their buyer gets this bill and they think we're cheating them. And, uh, and it gets really ugly, but it's part of the business that we do. Uh, Cindy, you there? Cindy, are you on this call? No. I was going to ask Cindy how many times a month she has to answer that question. I'll make a note of that. That would be interesting. But thank you, Robert. It's really and good. That's, we, just, we do the same similar kind of thing. We just call people like, and I remind people about it right after they close. So it's one of my excuses to call them right after we close. So it's a, hey, by the way. Yeah, it's just, hey, I just want to check in, see how things are going, see if you guys are getting settled into your new place. Also just wanted to remind you to keep your eyes out for the supplemental tax bill that's coming and save for it. This is how much, you know, what it's going to look like, that kind of thing. Good. Thanks, Melinda. Reva, go ahead. I was going to say, um, right in the middle of the talk, it was so interesting. My t One of my title reps came through. And I remember him explaining it to us before. And they'll sometimes have a flyer that you can give to your buyers. And he just hooked me up a minute ago. He's going to get me a flyer. So you guys can do the same thing. You can ask title companies. And sometimes, like, he happens to be with First American Title. You, they'll sometimes have information that will help you to explain it. Cool. And uh, anyways, give them a heads up. All right. Thank you for sharing. All right, anyone else? I have a question. Patty, go ahead. I have a question to them um, regarding tenants. Do they recommend waiting until the tenants moved out or do they just work with the tenants in there? What's the best advice? Depends on the tenant. Okay, so if you have so if you have tenants that are agreeable to let you see it, then it's okay even if it's sloppy, or do you like if it's kind of a mess, 
do you say it's better to wait or? Yeah, it just depends. Like, um, you know, we do a lot of, uh, a lot of units, two to four unit multifamilies. So almost always they're tenant occupied. Sometimes we'll only show, you know, a couple of the units to give them a picture or try to, you know, what they're kept like. But um, yeah, I think we'll, Melinda and I have one right now where the tenant is not getting out in time and they were supposed to be out a month ago. And so I don't think that's probably the kind of tenant that we would want to have present during, during showing. So yeah, I guess it's on a per case basis and you just have to use your best judgment. But, you know, I've been on showings before where tenants are there. <laughs> Actually, I just remembered one. I was on one uh, a couple of weeks ago. I went to show a property and there was a shirtless guy sitting there inside the house and another guy was cutting his hair and they were like cooking, cooking tacos and drinking beer. So those tenants probably would get them out before I showed it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I guess it's on a per case basis. I don't know how to, there's no general rule in my mind. Hey, good stuff. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks, Patty. Good information. Any other questions before we wrap it up? I don't have a, a question, Neil, but just something to point out is they don't make things harder than they have to be. So like the question came up about the REOs and Melinda's like, no, Robert's no. And I know, I don't know what Robert's like. I know Melinda doesn't really call expireds and things along those lines. It's database, call around your listings, up calls, things like that. Like they don't try to look for the gimmicks or the, the, whoa, this is hot right now. It's, they don't make it harder than it needs to be. It's just do the basics every day. It's Mike Ferry 101, a simple business. It's just not easy. Now, yeah, that's great. It's a great, great reminder. Absolutely. Okay, everybody unmute yourselves. Unmute yourselves. Let's give them a big hand. Woo, all right. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Melinda, Robert, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I know that the agents do and um, it's all good. And by the way, if you are uh, looking to refer anybody to the 210 corridor, to the Robert Kofer and Mark and Al team, or to um, Long Beach, to uh, Melinda and the Single Hill Eller area, um, you know, keep it in house, you guys. Keep it in house. Don't send it out. All right. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Good work. Thanks, All right. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, guys. And Melinda again. Good stuff. Hey, Cindy, just a question that we came up a couple minutes ago. Oh, sorry. That's all right. On a regular, how often do you get a question from our company, our clients, and agents on the other side that maybe we did the escrow for regarding supplemental bills? How often do you get that from, from people kind of upset that they just got a bill? Uh, I don't get it. Interesting. Okay. The agents might get it and they might know how to handle it, which is why I don't get it. Got it. But okay. they, nobody complains to me. Okay. Well, you guys are doing a great job. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I don't have anything else. Robert? Oh, great stuff. Very, very good. That was a good idea, Neil, to have them on here. Run through the finish line. Did anybody get anything about running through the finish line was a good idea? Nobody. I wrote it down. Great idea, Neil. <laughs> great idea. Oh, good. Okay, that's three, Robert. I think it's great. Four. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when they were talking about there's no competition, I don't know if you picked it up that way, but there's little less competition, less competition during the fourth quarter. It's because a lot of real estate agents um, aren't the hardest working group, not, not this group, okay? But a lot of agents aren't. And they kind of give up. It's, it's 
It's easy to stop them and hard to stop start them. You guys should write that down, okay? It's a saying I've had for 40 something years. In life, you have to be easy to start and hard to stop to be giantly successful. Most of what I call average real estate agents are easy to stop and hard to start, okay? So keep that in mind. And that's the difference, you know, when, when, I, when I coach, you know, we have right now, there's, I don't know, 15 or 20 Centurion agents within our company. We should post that at some point, Robert. The new, the new report is out. I mean, to have two Centurions in the top, two of our agents in the top 10 um, is pretty darn cool. We have a lot of good producing agents, but uh, you know, in the country, that's pretty awesome. In California, we have a ton of top agents, um, Centurion type agents, but they're not hard to start. If I have an idea with for Robert or Melinda, you know, for Jeanette or or, uh, or Meg or um, Oh my gosh, um, Monica Nogales, um, you guys know who you are. Yvonne, you know, gosh, I give Yvonne an idea and she's like out the street, you know, running back to me. Sonia, give her an idea. Yulin, geez, Yulin, you don't have to, you don't even have to finish the sentence and she's running down the street trying to practice it. Um, it's pretty amazing. And yet there are agents, you know, that you got to just talk into this stuff. And like I said, you know, you need to be easy to start and hard to stop to be giantly successful. That, that's what I like about working with Fred Salas, uh, Christina, Monica Nogales, uh, Andrea, new, new, recently new to the company, but you know, is just doing all that kind of crazy stuff with us. It's really great. I appreciate it. Yvette Jeter, that's on this on this call too. Is another one. Easy to start, hard to stop. Okay, that's what's going to make the difference for all of you guys. So, if I missed a name, I apologize, but that's what I see on the board right now. Um, Savannah somebody that's easy to start, hard to stop. We talked about Sonia, Andrea. It's true, you guys. Take it and run with it. This is an amazing example of these two people. And, and they're going to crush it. They're going to do probably another, each of them, each of their teams will probably do another 30 to 40 transactions before the end of the year. Pretty cool, huh? That was very inspirational. That seems good. I just yeah. want to say that that lets you know that everybody's human. She has a child. I mean, if she could do it, anyone can. If we right. just have to have the mindset and the ambition to focus and work hard and do it. She does have a new child. And I will say that Robert Kofer is a very hands-on dad and, um, is very involved with getting the kids to school and getting them ready in the morning. Um, and his two days off are really two days that he spends doing stuff with the kids and his wife and allowing his wife not to have to do the stuff that she does. She's a stay at home mom, um, but he's very involved. So, you know, it's, it's really very, very cool stuff. I have Trina, Trina is another one who's easy to start and hard to stop. It's really doing a great job out there. All right, you guys. You know, uh, Neil, on that, on that point, you know, we've heard a couple of people say, you know, it's possible, inspirational, things like that. We didn't get into this today from time perspective, but, you know, Rob, you know, Melinda, for example, Melinda's from Wisconsin and did back her prior to real estate, was making $30,000 a year working in theater, uh, doing the backstage stuff. Stage manager. Yeah. You know, um, and so, and the only reason she got into real estate is because she decided to buy a house 
And the real estate agent was so awful that she's like, well, if they can make that much money, I should be able to do this. So when you look at it, yeah, anyone can do it is she's a prime example of someone who didn't grow up in Southern California, didn't have a database here, didn't have a sales background, didn't have family in this or anything like that. She just put in the effort. So to everyone's point, yeah, it is. She's a prime example of it's possible. So very cool. All right. All right, Thanks everybody. So. Uh, 